I am Ellie Marzulli. I write books. I make films. I yak a lot. And this is going to be a presentation. What are the giants, UFOs, elongated skulls, and earthworks have in common? Folks, they have everything in common. And our mission statement is this, to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald the return of the King Jesus. And that's what we do. And all those four things I just talked about, giants, UFOs, elongated skulls, the mounds all over the United States, they're all the fingerprints, in my opinion, of the dark side, fingerprints of the dragon. And so we're pushing back. I mean, no one's, a few people have sort of delved into it, but we're like, I'm going to date myself here. We're full tilt boogie on this, <laughs> completely into it. So we've exposed the deception of the prince of the power of the air, and that's what we'll do here tonight, but we're also heralding the return of the King Jesus because I believe that we're in a window of time unlike any other. I'm going to put this down because it's annoying me. Thank you. But I really do. I think we're in a window of time unlike any other before. Events are accelerating. Jesus warns us that even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. Now, that's not a feel-good statement. That's not a statement that makes me just, you know, want to snuggle up in a blanket and have a cup of hot cocoa or a coffee, and just, it doesn't make me want to do that. It makes me kind of go, whoa, what the heck is that? Even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. So something is coming. Something is, in fact, as you'll see in a minute, is already here. Something has already been revealed, and the church has this morbid propensity towards ambivalence when it comes to the whole UFO phenomena. It's like, we don't care. It's just like, well, that's okay, but you know, we're just gonna talk about Jesus. Okay, I get that. In the meantime, all this stuff is coming down. As Paul talks about um, leaving the, the fundamentals, we don't need the fundamentals. Those of us who are saved and born again and spirit-filled, we don't need the fundamentals of that. We know what that is. We know what salvation is. Now let's fight, find out what's going on in the war because we are at war. This war is raging all around us. This is the territory of the prince of the power of the air, i.e. dragon. That's who owns this planet. Even though the Lord has the title deed, I get it. But we're in a war. We can see it all around us. Lawlessness reigns wherever we go. Lawlessness is everywhere. It's unbelievable. So I want to get right into it. So this is the UFO update. And the reason why I have to depart from the mounds thing is because if I don't arm you with this, I'm not doing my job. And what's happening, this is Tucker Carlson. This is 2017. This is with Commander Fravor. UFOs have been the stuff of conspiracy theorists for decades, often mocked for talking about it, but maybe they shouldn't be mocked. So this is 2017 with Tucker Carlson. This is when, December 2017, I saw this and I fell out of my chair, asked my wife, literally. I went, oh my gosh, that's disclosure. Because you'll see when Commander Fravor comes on, he's talking about the UFO phenomenon. And it's a triptych. You've got Tucker Carlson here, you've got uh, David Fravor here, and then you've got the UFO. I'm going to move a little bit because of time. I'm just going to scroll over. There's Fravor. And there's the tic-tac-shaped UFO. And I just blew it. OK, here we go. We get out to the spot where they tell us it's at. Um, we start looking around. And both of us, both airplanes, see a disturbance in the water and a white 40-foot long tic-tac-shaped tic object just hovering above the water, going forward, back, left, right. There's no rotor wash. There's no wings, nothing. So as we drive around in a clockwise flow, we get to about the 9 o'clock position, and I said, well, I'm going to go down and check it out, and the other jet is going to stay high. So as we go down, and when we get to the 12 o'clock position, it starts to mirror us. So it's in a clockwise flow, and it's on the opposite side of the circle from us. And we continue this. It's in a climb. We're in a descent. We're getting a great look at it. This whole thing takes about probably up to five minutes from the time we show up. I get over to the 8 o'clock position. It's at about the 2 o'clock position, and I decide I'm going to go and see what it is, and it's about 2,000 feet below me. And I cut across the circle, and as I get within about a half mile of it, it rapidly accelerates to the south in about two seconds and disappears. Rapidly accelerates two seconds and disappears. Who is this guy? Who's Commander Fravor? How does he get on Fox News? How do they get classified footage of a UFO? Because it is classified footage of a UFO, and now it's on national TV. It's not on George Norrie coast to coast, where I frequent frequently or go there frequently. How is it that it gets on there? Who picks up the phone and calls the producers at Fox News and goes, hey, we got this guy on, we want to get him on next Tuesday. How does that sound? Nobody knows who Commander Fravor is. He doesn't have a book. He doesn't have a DVD. He's on an election circuit. Essentially, before this, he was an unknown. But now, he's a household word, Commander David Fravor, F-18 pilot. Watch what he says here when Tucker asked him, in your opinion, what do you think this is? I wanted to fly it. <laughs> yeah, but, I bet. Uh, 
uh, you know, there's, you know, talking to some physicists, they don't think the human body could handle that kind of force with that yeah, acceleration. Yeah, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like the human body could. So bottom line, what do you think this was? Here we go. I believe, as do the other folks that were on the flight, that we, when we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. When we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. When we visually saw it, that it was something not from this world. Okay, that's disclosure. You're laughing, but that's disclosure. Something not from this world on Tucker Carlson, Fox News. It's not George Norway coast to coast. And you would think, you would think that my phone would blow up. You would think that pastors would begin to talk about this because this is the coming great deception. This is what it is. And, and the springboard, I have a whole presentation, which I don't have time to get into because we're talking about the mound builders. But I'm trying to warn you, us, of what's here already. This is 2017. The next one, and there's a series of people about every four to six weeks, sometimes more frequently, on Tucker Carlson, that seems to be the gate. He's had a whole bunch of people, like, like Nick Pope, for instance, who used to be part of this whole UFO investigation thing. So Pope is there, other people have been on Tucker Carlson, all revealing the reality of a so-called extraterrestrial presence. Every Friday, ancient aliens holds court. Your kids guarantee, guarantee, know more about the ancient alien paradigm than they do about the paradigm of the Bible. Where, where are all the under 30-year-olds in this, in this audience? If the Lord tarries in another 15 years, there won't be a prophecy conference. <laughs> Think about it. We failed them because they don't know what the gospel is and they don't understand the severity of the times that we live in, the unprecedented times that we live in, unlike any other time in history. Men rowing to and fro over the face of the earth and knowledge increases, just like the prophet Daniel writes, what, 2,500 years ago? In the latter days, knowledge will increase and men will run to and fro over the face of the earth. And that's exactly what we see happening. Exactly what we see happening. So here's, here's the second... Watch this. This is Commander Luis Elizondo. So the first, the first rung on the disclosure ladder is Commander David Fravor saying that whatever this was was not of this world. Okay, got that? So what the heck was it? The second rung of a disclosure ladder happened this year. And I called Gary Stearman. We both chatted for about an hour because it was unbelievable. This is Luis Elizondo. Again, I'll skip through it. Basically, at the very end... Of the, of the interview, Tucker Carlson asks Mr. Elizondo, in your opinion, does the United States government have debris from crash UFOs? He looks right at the camera and he says, yes. <clears throat> he asks it again, as you'll see. And then he kind of hems it off, well, I don't want to give my non-disclosure agreement away, but the short answer to that is yes. So he's giving it away. <clears throat> I mean, you can't, you can't do that. Watch this. <clears throat> May 31st, 2019. Well, for many, many decades, the U.S. government has dismissed out of hand UFO sightings as crank stuff, things that lunatics babble about. Now, suddenly they're taking a different approach. They are telling the truth. They're finally admitting that UFO sightings are, in fact, routine, and the government is now being systematic in investigating the question of UFOs. A new History Channel documentary called Unidentified will explore the military's many recent encounters with unidentified aircraft. The object the Navy pilot So that's tracking. Elizondo. I want to go to the end for time. But of that being the case, if these are uh, Russian or Chinese. Boy, you know, Tucker, you, you don't want me to give my opinion. I, I, the one thing I... So once again, we have a triptych. We have Tucker Carlson. We have Luis Elizondo. We've got pictures of real UFOs. So I'm going to skip down here to the, to the second rung. And this is when Tucker Carlson asked Elizondo about the debris. Five or a F-22. We can tell you even what airline it is uh, and, and the difference between the models of aircraft within that type of aircraft. So I think it's highly unlikely that a foreign adversary was successful right. in developing something like this. So let me ask you one last question. Do you believe, based on your decade of, of serving in the U.S. government on, on this question, that the U.S. government has in its possession any material from one of these aircrafts? Ooh, uh, I, I do, yes. You think the U.S. government has debris from a UFO in its possession right now? Unfortunately, Tucker, I, I really have to be careful of my NDA. I really can't go into a lot of more detail in that. Okay. But uh, simply put, yes. So the, the bottom, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a totally staged question because if you have a non-disclosure agreement, the answer to that is I cannot confirm or deny uh, that question and you move on. I can't answer that. I'm sorry. That's what you do. You don't do this this little tap dance and go, well, the short answer to that is yes. We just blew your NDA out of the water. 
That's the second rung of a disclosure ladder. Folks, you've got to understand something, that the great deception is upon us. And the springboard to it is a Darwinian theory that somehow we just all magically evolved out of primordial slime billions of years ago. So that is the, the, the paradigm in which people, uh, the scientific community and academic community run. They run on Darwin. That's, that's the whole deal. So this fits right in with the Darwinian paradigm because the neo-Darwinists, the new Darwinists, are looking out there because they realize the complexity of the deoxyribonucleic acid, the double helix spiral of life, which is the building blocks of all life on this planet and probably everywhere else, couldn't have just sprung into existence. So they know that. So they're looking out there for our creators. And this is where it's going. And you need to be armed, seriously, seriously. The second rung of a disclosure ladder has been breached. <laughs> They're at the gates, Saya, but they are. They're at the gates. And we don't know what the third rung is going to be, but it, but it is coming. Absolutely, it is coming. So watch this one. This is Elizondo once again on Tucker Carlson last Friday. Watch what he says. And again, I'll skip forward. Just a few weeks ago, the Navy admitted for the first time that several UFO videos were real, meaning they show actual area phenomenon that so far the Pentagon cannot explain. Now a UFO Investigations Group says they have found materials that could potentially be physical evidence of UFOs. Luis Elizondo is Director of Special Programs at the To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. He also headed the Pentagon's office for investigating UFO incidents, and it shed light on the question of what UFOs might be. Sure. Well, our company over the last year and a half has actually obtained quite a bit of material. And let me first preface by saying some of that material that's providence is, is frankly hearsay, while other uh, the providence of some of this material is, has been substantiated. And ultimately, we're in the process of analyzing this material at three different levels. We're looking at its physical properties, its chemical or, if you will, molecular properties, and then ultimately its atomic properties. And it's really at that point we'll be able to make some sort of uh, stop right there. So as he's talking on the right side of a triptych, that cluster was North Carolina last week. 13, 14 UFOs that hovered over the water. So this is, this is mainstream. This is Fox News. This is, I keep saying it, it's not your story. Those, there they are. And, and, and most of us sleep. The church dithers. The church won't talk about it. And yet I have people coming up to the table who have been going to churches all their lives and have had encounters, but they're too afraid to tell anybody, but they'll tell me. And the dirty little secret of the whole UFO thing must be exposed. And we need to be talking about this 24-7. And we need to be warning people what this is. This is, in my opinion, the coming great deception. When they show up, when not if, because it's already happening. When they really show up, when the mile-wide craft just goes bang like that and just sits in the sky, the entire planet goes like this and shifts. Everything shifts. Your world, my world, our world will be completely different. Everything will be referred to as before disclosure and after disclosure, Richard Dolan's book. But that's, what, that's what's coming. That's, trust me, that's what is coming. They are rolling it out. I never thought I would see this like this, but we're seeing it. And I've been banging this drum for 30 years. 30 years I've been banging this drum. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Finally, it's here, and there's this ambivalence within the church. We need to wake up and understand that the source of this is not entities from that are particularly, there's something else. And they will, they will claim that there are progenitors, our creators. They'll state that we created all life on this planet. We genetically manipulated early man. We jump-started the world's civilizations. We started the world's religion, now at this critical juncture in human history, and we are sort of at a critical juncture. All we need is a nuke going off someplace, and it will create the greatest collective fear that mankind has ever known because we're all wired together. So if that happens, that's when I think they're gonna show up. There's a saying that I, uh, Gary and I bandied about, that we go up, they show up. We go up, they come down. And that's what I think is gonna happen. The church gets raptured out of here, and that's the restrainer, perhaps, from keeping them manifesting. That's conjecture, we'll have to wait and see. But what's alarming about this is we're already seeing it. It's already beginning to manifest right in front of our noses. And yet most of us just, just sleep through it. Most of our pastors, God bless them, we need to pray for them. Well, they're under the gun, but they need to address this, and they need to address it soon. Not after the fact, but before the fact, a priori. 
Okay, even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. Without standing up, I just want, at the count of three, I'll go one, two, three, and then you guys will say, I will not be deceived. Now, this presentation, the UFO presentation, is really like an hour and a half. And at the end of that, you get enough information to actually stand up and yell, I will not be deceived. But I've given you enough to start doing your own research. We've got tons of resources out there. I'm not going to hype them. They are what they are. But they're on the table. And other people here have resources. Arm yourself. Tell a friend. Try to get the young people interested because they're already watching the ancient alien thing. So I'm going to say one, two, three, and you guys are going to go, I will not be deceived. Ready? One, two, three. I will not be deceived. Okay. And we believe that. This is from the Mysterious Mound Builders. This whole new series is called I'm a Trail of a Nephilim. And at 56 minutes, this will be really interesting. <laughs> Mathematical Mysteries of the Mound Builders. Two millennia ago, a culture that is still unknown to us today erected thousands of mounds throughout the Midwestern United States to the Gulf of Mexico. They're called the Hopewell, the Adena, or the Mississippian. However, no one knows what these people actually call themselves. In other words, they remain mysterious and unknown to us today. When the first white settlers came in the Great Circle Mound in Ohio, they asked the Native Americans living there, who built this? The natives replied that they didn't know who built them, as these large mounds were there and abandoned when they arrived. Let me stop right there. I, I spent two days ago, I was in the presence of a wonderful First Nation person. He's a medicine man raised by the Lakota Sioux. And I asked him, I said, well, what about the mounds? He said, we didn't build them. Just like, I mean, it's, it was no, there was no equivocation, no hesitation on his part. It was just, we didn't build them. Now, they may have helped on some of them, and the smaller ones, yeah, but stuff like, like we'll get into here if they didn't build them. The discovery of these mounds created a controversy, as some positive the mounds were built by an unknown lost tribe of people who migrated, perhaps, from the old world. Others thought they could be one of the lost tribes of Israel. The debate continued until the latter part of the 19th century, when the conclusion was made that Native Americans had built the mounds, but they had simply forgotten they had done so. It always gets a laugh. That's what you're taught if you want to become an archaeologist. That's, that's the paradigm that they're under. This is now the accepted paradigm. However, is it the truth of what occurred in the ancient past, or has the information been managed to bolster a particular narrative? Join us as we explore the mysterious mound builders. Tick Island is in Florida. Every now and then, let me get a slurp here. Every now and then, I get stuff across my desk. And one day, a while back, <clears throat> I got this email, and the guy said that as a, as a small boy, they went out to this island. It was a huge midden, shell mound, but there were burials. It was like five acres and like 100 feet high. The thing was huge. So it's you know a couple thousand years or whatever of, of piling all these shells, and there were burials there. And he said as a boy, they went out there, and his mother took pictures, which you see there, and also film. So I'm going like, well, what did you guys find? And, and the guy, the kid, who's now like, basically my age, um, was stating that in one area of the island, there were 10-footers that they uncovered. I said, well, did you film it? He goes, we don't know. Mom didn't want to film the skeletons. So we didn't know. But he sends the film out. We take the film. We take it to a place in Hollywood. They digitize everything because it was like 16 millimeter or 8 millimeter, whatever it was. It was old and brittle. But they digitize it. And I went over frame by frame by frame by frame by frame. No pay dirt. There were no giant skeletons. However, there was an elongated skull that, we, that, we, that, that is actually in the film. And the archaeologist who came onto the site much, much later is shown like this, kind of hamming it up in front of the camera. And then he takes a brush, and he reaches back like this and brushes off the elongated skull. But this, this, this man went on the record, and it's in the film. His, his testimony on the phone is in the film that when he was a boy, the femur bone, which is right here, this is my leg bone. So he's a kid about, you know, you can see maybe seven or eight there. And, the, and that femur bone of that giant in the grave would come up above his waist. So that's a really big guy. So we know that they're there. We've got newspaper articles. We've got eyewitnesses that talked about the giants that they uncovered. We also have a Native American First Nation people who talk about fighting giants with red hair and six fingers. So we know it existed. Um, Indian Relic Hunter, Bilsher family, pastime, and of course this, is a, this isn't what they saw. This is another <clears throat> photo from something else, but it gives us an idea. This is a, a over seven feet, two inches, found in a mound, uh, the Okefenoki Swamp. They're everywhere. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Who is the prince of the power of the air? Somebody, anybody. 
Okay, so we all, most of us know. The dragon, Satan. It's one of his titles, the prince of the power of the air. So here we are, and I want you to cut the volume on this. I don't want the music playing. This is the great serpent mount. And, oh, let me try it again. Okay. So this is the Great Serpent Mount. It's near Peebles, Ohio. I've been there three times. By the way, when you're in an area like this, when you go to these places, you need to pray up before you get there and you need to pray up afterwards. These are highly charged sites. In many cases, ritualistic stuff was done. So this drone here is about 300 feet up and you can see, now you can see the undulations of a serpent. And those undulations point to <clears throat> the equinoxes and the solstice. In the very front, you can see it right there. They had the head of the serpent and in front of him is an egg. Genesis 3.15, the seed, the offspring of a serpent, will be at war at enmity with the offspring, the seed of the woman. He, the coming Messiah, will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. This is Genesis, Genesis 3.15 screaming at us. It's thousands of years old. The, the new signage at the, um, at the site says the Shawnee built it. But as you'll see later, Chief Riverwind comes on and says, the Shawnee didn't build this. This is a great injustice. In fact, the Shawnee go out of their way to say, no, we didn't build a serpent mound. So there's a narrative that's, that's being promulgated, um, and you've got to ask, we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? All these undulations that you see, the mouth, by the way, points to the summer solstice. This is, this is incredible. And these are hunter-gatherers 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, the, the debate. Some people put it older, some people put it younger. You know, archaeologists argue amongst themselves. You can see the waterway on the left-hand side. A good shot of the head. In the, in the middle of the egg, there used to be an altar and also a pillar. We found the pillar, someone had pushed it over the cliff there, and it's now in the dirt. We're, we're trying to, to convince them to let us raise the pillar and bring it back on the site and also see if there's handwriting or hieroglyphs or something any type of a marking on the pillar. No one's ever done this. I mean, you got to, eh. but there was an altar there, and according to what we believe, there was human sacrifice done there. So that's just another shot of it. Summer solstice sunrise, equinox sunrise. Why go through the trouble of creating something like this? What's the point? And the people who are doing it can't see it anyway. When you're, when you're there, the mounds are about this high, and it undulates, and the serpent is, you can see the tail. I mean, you, you, can, you walk and you walk, and you, it's not some small little thing. It's like probably four times the size of this room. It's really big, at least three times the size of this room, lengthwise. So you know, you're walking along like this, and this thing is undulating, and they built a two-story two -story tower, and you can go up on top of that, and you still really can't see what it is until you're up in the air. And the moment we're up in the air, you go, oh my gosh, look at this. It's the largest serpent effigy on the planet, <clears throat> the great serpent now. Who built it and why? Who is the prince of the power of the air? How would you check your work? And how did these people know about the equinoxes and the solstices? The longest day, the shortest day, the days where e they go out of their way, they are obsessed with lunar calendars, they're obsessed with advanced geometry, trigonometry, and it's all embedded in these mounds as you'll see in just a little bit. Cahokia is the largest mound in the United States. It's probably upwards of 450,000 tons of earth that were moved, roughly. 450,000 tons of earth. So it begs the question, how was this done? And this is the essence of, of, of the case, in my opinion. You got all this dirt, you got a group of hunter-gatherers, they've got primitive tools. <laughs> the, the, the plaza in front of Cahokia, according to the archaeologist that I spoke to, is dead level within two inches. So you got like a, like a 20 or a 30 acre plaza, 30 acre plaza and it's dead level to two inches and they don't have transits, how was that done? <clears throat> See where I'm going with all this stuff? How do you move forward at 50,000 tons of earth? And this is just one mound. This is just one mound. There's 10,000 mounds in Ohio. They're all over the place. Pick up a, a book by Squire and Davis. Thank God they were there. They were surveyors. They surveyed all this stuff. <clears throat> There's also the plateau on top. You can see it, a very level place. They, they believe, from what they've discovered, that there was a 10-foot stockade wall all around this mound. Why? Why, why was that done? The Mississippi is in the background. Highly charged place, it's right near St. Louis. And when you go there, it's like, well, they built it one basket full at a time. Oh, really? Really. That's, see, you guys, you guys are right there, you start laughing. But you know, that's what, they, that's what they believe. This is Poverty Point, the second largest mound in the United States, 390,000 tons of earth. So what we did, and you can see the advanced mathematics, the uh, isosceles triangles, um, everything is laid out. 
It's deliberate. And you can't, you know, it's one thing if I took a piece of paper like this and began to sketch it, but these are angles. So I, in order, I mean, in order to use a protractor and a compass and a ruler, I mean, I have to know geometry. I just can't be guessing at angles. That's not the way things work. You've, you've got to know what you're doing. But, and it's one thing to do it on a piece of paper like this. It's another thing to do it on a site that's like, you know, 30, 40, 50 acres. The, the site of the octagon mound is 50 acres. 50 acres. How do you check your work if you're making an octagon? And you can't see what you're making unless you're in the air. But the archaeologists just brush it all away. The Native Americans built all this. That's the stock answer. And if you, if you want tenure in a university, if you want to be a, um, in charge of a, one of these sites, you, you toe the party line. No one thinks, in my opinion. Let me check my time here. Golly, 46 minutes. I'm in trouble. So this is Fort Ancient. This Fort Ancient is the largest uh, earthworks in the Americas, 3.5 miles, with 66 gates. And we're there, and I get out of the car, and it's wintertime. It's actually the spring equinox. And my wife Peggy's got this little thing on her cell phone which shows you the constellations. So these two mounds, which are one of the gates in this thing, and the mounds are probably 20 feet in diameter and probably about 10 feet tall, right next to each other. And of course, a road goes right through the middle of it. Go figure. But the mounds are there, and she's like this, because it's the equinox. Okay? And, she, and the, 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 the constellation, Hydra, the serpent, comes right over the gate. That's deliberate. That's just not an accident. Here it is, the equinox, and the constellation, the serpent, Hydra, comes up right, it's right over the gate. Not it, it, right over the gate. Totally deliberate. Who is, <coughs> excuse me. Who is the prince of the power of the air? This is the fingerprints of a supernatural we're looking at. It's all over the Americas. I call this Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. <coughs> These are shots of what Fort Ancient used to look like. See how small the people are? See how big this mound is? 3.5 miles of that. How many people have ever dug just with a hand shovel? Okay, right, 3.5, and they insist. And you'll see how they, they, they say, this is, you'll see it in a second, so watch this. We need some volume, please. And I'm gonna skip to where the good part is here. So here they are. Cherokee, you're a little bit Shawnee. Shawnee tradition, Cherokee heritage. Yeah. This is Dosenchak. So I'm excited to kind of learn a little bit about my heritage, but I'm in a garden, so. What's going on here? So this garden depicts crops that were grown 2,000 and 1,000 oh. years ago by the Hopewell cultural people. And they were very simple, complex horticultural. Okay, I want to stop right here. He goes, these we call the Hopewell people. They have no idea what these people call themselves. Do you understand that? Hopewell is an English farmer. He discovers some artifacts. So they name all these artifacts after Hopewell. They have no idea who the people are, what they call themselves, or anything else, but they'll tell you all about it. Down to the nuance. Well, we call the Hopewell people. They have no idea. No idea how things are built. Because of time, I'm going to skip ahead to the fun part. So he's talking about the garden right here. This is where, watch her face. And gourds. OK. And we also have native tobacco that is growing. And when all this was built, Maybe give it more volume, please. simple tools. And I can hand this to you. Yeah. We have the shoulder blade. Or excuse me, the um, clamshell hoe. Watch okay. your face here. Now, what's this used for? This would be used for gardening, as well as. <laughs> I, I just love the uh, you guys always crack up because it's like she's going, "Come on now." Creating 18,000 feet of earth walls here at Fort Ancient. And that's sturdy enough to do something with. They would have had a little bit more sturdier, but wow. they would. They would have had more sturdy clams back then. What? I mean, it's like you're just making this stuff up. Drives me nuts. Gone through a lot of clamshells. Okay. And then also you have the deer shoulder blade. The way the deer shoulder blade. <laughs> and then inserted into the shaft and then wrapped with it. Rawhide of that animal. Again, look how flimsy it is. Yeah, it's They would go through a lot of bone tools, and a lot of shoulder blades of deer and elk and split elk antler. Just what is here? It's just, it's just beyond belief. So this is Jack again explaining to everybody 
what happens if you deconstruct the mounds in a, at Fort Ancient. Watch. So now, Fort Ancient, it's a 2,000 year old prehistoric earthwork site. We're on the short list for World Heritage Recognition right now, uh, which means that uh, we are going to be considered for a global destination. For okay, I'm going to skip up to, to where the good part is right walls here. Walls built 2,000 years ago by people that we call the Hopewell Cultural People. They would have used nothing more than the shoulder bones of deer and elk, split up antler, clamshell, hose, digging sticks. Placing the soil into baskets that we've demonstrated would have held no more than about 35 to 40 pounds of soil. Well, how do we know that? So he goes, how do we know that? Because they found one, up, and I, you know, this is what I want to know, because I've heard this repeated at all the sites. They, they use this example. We found one basket full of dirt. Well, you don't know when that basket full of dirt was put in there. How do you know it wasn't much later after the site was abandoned and it was used as a second internment? You don't know that. Where did it come from? See? Uh, so it's like, eh. And I've heard this story repeated at all the different sites. So somebody's feeding them this information. So I'm going to skip a little bit further because he's talking about, you know, 30 pounds of dirt. Now he's talking about the deconstruction of the mounds. We'll pick it up there. Of soil. So to figure out volume, you take your tape measure, measure the length of the stain, the depth of the stain, give those measurements to somebody who got better than straight C's in high school general math. That was me. Yeah. And it gives you volume. There is an estimated 553,000 cubic yards of soil at this site. Now, what's that mean to you guys? Absolutely nothing. It's strategic. Uh, well, well, and again, we are not a fort. We are a prehistoric church. But 553,000 cubic yards of soil. If we were to uh, tear apart all of the earth walls, all 18,000 feet, and put them into dump trucks, each dump truck holding between 15 and 20 tons of soil and park it at the Jeremiah Morrow Bridge on Interstate 71, which is about a mile and a half away from here. Start parking the dump trucks end for end. You will end up 15 miles from downtown Cleveland, 200 miles away. So you have 200 miles of dump trucks end to end. 200 miles of dump trucks. Mainstream archaeology insists these mounds were created with primitive tools. So guess what we did? We had a, a guy who makes these things for museums. Cost me $350, and he made it. And then we hired a fit laborer who took this, this hoe, this primitive hoe, and went out near Poverty Point and dug. So we'll show you that in just a second. We were curious to see how an ancient flint hoe would actually work in the soil around Poverty Point. We hired a flint maker to create a replica of the hoe, and after procuring a fit laborer, headed out into the field to see how much dirt could be dug, collected and hauled to the mound site. My name is Rick Woodward, now, I'm an archeologist. I'm gonna skip because of time. That's Rick Woodward, he's our team's archeologist. So watch this part here when Oh, I can't believe I just did that again. To do that, to see how the mounds were built and, and the time factor that it would take. I wanted to describe this hoe a little bit, this handle, where it was uh, pitch, and you can't see the pitch, but inside of these wrappings. That's not slow motion. There's a dark uh, resin pitch that would have acted as a glue to hold this in. So the guy's digging, digging, digging. Now he gathers it up. And, they would have been able and this would have been a, a deer skin or a birch bark basket. Very rugged instrument. And then he goes across the field. Let's take that soil that we've dug out of the hole and we're going to put it into a vessel and we're going to time that operation. This is all in the film, by the way. To see how much time it takes to do that. Once we get that done, we're going to take... So I'm going to get to the punchline. So you can see that here he is. He gets the dirt. He gets the one basket. He goes trucking across the field to where the, where the mound would be. Now he dumps it. It have been dumped. I just love this. See, we haven't even it done a compaction test down? on any of these mounds because the dirt was compacted, but how? And they timed the operation, and this is where the punchline is. So it's all that amount of time, and then we go here. Each truck and trailer holds 40 tons of soil. <clears throat> 71 man bucket trips to create one ton of soil. 
390,000 tons of earth to create Poverty Point. 9,750 double tractor trailer loads of dirt to move that, that 390,000 tons. Basically 28 million one-man bucket loads of dirt to create the mound at Poverty Point. That's Miamisburg. There were over 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. There's Fritz Zimmerman on the top of it. Seriously? Seriously. Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology, you tell me. Giant bones in the mounds, science and earth relics of Indians who lived 700 years ago. Strange skeletons found. Giants in North America, this is my work on Catalina Island, which I used to look at constantly from not the house, but when I would be down on Pacific Coast Highway, I'd go by it and, hi, how you doing, Ralph? That's Ralph Glidden, who was hired by the Hay Museum. Hay Museum was later gobbled up by the Smithsonian Institute. Gary Stearman was the one that said, hey, LA, you can get that picture analyzed. So I analyzed it. I had three people look at the picture, that's the original, and analyze it. See the skeleton in front of that? So three people, three different people, no collusion between them, put that skeleton at just under nine feet. We separate the man, we separate the skeleton, we put them down together, eight foot nine inches, we rounded it down for error, and we could have rounded it up to eight foot six. It gives you an idea of what we're looking at. We know Ralph Gooden, the little guy there, was five foot eight. We're positive of that. So that's what we're looking at. We have giants, we have six-fingered skeletons. How many fingers do you see there? There's six. What does the Bible tell us about six-fingered giants that roam the land? This skeleton, based on that bowl, we estimate there was another nine-footer. Look at the size of a skull, look at the orbits, look at the size of the hand, that is a six-fingered skeleton. Here's my picture published in the book, On the Trail of a Nephilim. We went back to the museum, the late Richard Shaw, a good friend, and I really miss him, and myself. You can see Rick's hands, he's holding my book up. Look at the picture in the book, you see the skeleton. And the museum wall, what's missing? Now why would the museum do that? Now, ladies are scientists. They stand for truth, justice, and the American way. <laughs> really. So they cropped the picture. They cropped the picture to get rid of the giant skeleton. So we took pictures of that, and then that went viral. Because you got to get out ahead of it. You got to publish, 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 and let people see what's going on. So the new museum has got the picture, my picture, blown up like this big, and it talks about Ralph Gooden, but guess what? Not a word about the giant. Not a word about how big the skeleton is. I was also on the Jim Vieira show, In Search of the Lost Giants, and we talked about that also. Uh, moving into the skulls now, because this is all, look folks, it's all connected. I'm looking for like a unified theory, and, and it's, all, it's all cooked up, as Russ Dizdar would say, in Hell's Kitchen. Look at the normal skull on the far left, that's where the foramen magnum should be. You can examine the skulls on the table for yourself and see them. Look how the position of the foramen magnum in these two skulls, and one of them is here. It's genetic. I've got medical doctors coming in a new film that we're working on, the DNA film. All of them say the same thing. It's genetic. You can't, you can't cranial deform. You can't cradle headboard the infant and push the occipital plate. You can't do that. Back towards the foramen magnum, the brain hole. You can't do that. So it's done in utero. It's done in the womb. And it's an elongated skull. So this is what we're looking at. And you, they're on the table. Come by, and especially if you're a doctor or whatever. The foramen magnum, you can't move the occipital plate towards the foramen magnum. You'd kill the child. And yet, skull after skull after skull, this is what we see. This is the Chongo skull. I'll show you now, but it's never been seen before. What I mean by that is that most audiences, um, where I'm lecturing, you'll see this. But we shot this film in 2018, 2017 actually, in the, in the Ica Museum. We were there getting DNA. And I asked the archaeologist, hey, can we see the Chongo skull? Because we want to turn it over to see where the foramen magnum is. So we go in there, and they, to my amazement, they roll, they, you know, they turn the lights on. The museum was empty that day. Watch oh this. Oh my God, it's right in the back. It's, oh, why? Why are you doing that to me? It really is. You can hear me go, oh my gosh, it's all the way in the back. Look at that. Oh my God. I mean, if it's any further back, it's outside the skull. It's outside the skull, it's genetic. And yet, why is it that about every three to four weeks now, I get emails from people that are on different websites, they're talking about all these elongated skulls found in Russia and elsewhere were all the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. Why is that? Why are they telling us that? Why are they jamming us down the throat? Why should we believe what you say? 
Why? When we've got this. No one's ever seen that before. That thing, if it's any further, it's outside the skull. I couldn't believe it. Let's move on. So when we did the DNA on these groups, and they didn't like the results, we found a haplogroup H2A, which is European. We found the DNA analysis of this particular skull, uh, basically T2B, which is Mesopotamia, Syria, and Turkey. The baby skull, which we actually unwrapped, was U2E1 that was done by two different labs three different times. Again, that's European. Why is this important? Because we're told over and over and over again that at the end of the last ice age, everybody came down from Beringia and suddenly Americas. We're saying, yeah, that's true to a degree, but guess what? They came from the Middle East also and Europe because that's what the mitochondrial DNA shows, which means it was a migration. Guess when the Paracas people show up? 3,500 years ago, roughly. Guess what happened 3,500 years ago? Joshua and Caleb are pressing the conquest of the, of the Promised Land, of the Levant, of Israel. That's what they're doing. And we believe there's a diaspora of these Nephilim tribes, which just completely vacate the premises. And they hop, the island hop all through the Mediterranean. They go into, and we, we, we were there this year. They go into Spain, they go into Portugal, they go into France, they go into the UK, and they finally come over here. The whole idea of the copper trade. I mean, this is, it's so deep, and, it's, and yet it's all there, and it's all managed by people who don't want this known. Why? LA, that sounds like a conspiratologist thing. Yeah, right. Just like the UFO thing, I used to be called Mr. Tinfoil Hat. Now everybody's going, hmm, maybe LA's right about this. Same thing here. These guys just make stuff up. They just make it up. They just make it up. Why? Because anything that points back in the supernatural may, in fact, show the validity of our biblical prophetic narrative. May actually go, wow, maybe the Bible's really true. Maybe Jesus really did come. Maybe I will die in my sin unless I go before him. Whoa, what a concept. Amen. That's what salvation is. You just ask and he, he comes in. Anyway, let's move on. So is there a bias in academia? You bet your booties. This guy's fired from University of Southern California, Mark Armitage. He went, went to a place called Hell's Creek and he found this huge, why is it yellow? He found this huge Trisopterus fossil. So he takes it back to his lab. And, and Mark Armitage is the microscopist. He builds scanning electron microscopes. So he gets this thing, he takes a, takes a slice, puts it in to the, the microscope, he finds soft tissue in a fossil. Ah, that's not supposed to happen. So he writes a paper and publishes it in a secular, not a Christian thing, not a young earth thing or creationist deal, nothing like that, a secular scientific journal who are chomping at the bit to get this information. He doesn't mention anything about Christianity, doesn't mention anything about anything. He just, this is a fact, look what I found. He's immediately fired from his position. How dare you bring your religious prejudice into this institution, bum, 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 bum. And so what he did is he sued them and he won. They settled out of court, bully for him. All he did is present the facts. We did the same thing with our DNA. We were, oh, it's all contaminated. All 58 samples are contaminated? Then if it was contaminated, surely we did our DNA, then it would show up, but it didn't show up, except for one, when we threw that out. And if, if, it was, if it was contaminated, then we'd have nuclear DNA, but we don't have any nuclear DNA. And they never talk about the morphological, the structural differences of our skulls that we, that we examine. They never talk about that. There is a managed agenda on this planet, a managed agenda to deliberately confuse, obfuscate, steer anybody away from anything supernatural. Because that's where the truth lies, is in the supernatural reality of the biblical narrative. So Armitage gets fired from his, uh, <coughs> from his university, and eventually, like I already said, he settles out of court. Ben Stein's movie, if you haven't seen it spelled, go home and watch it, because he, he nails this thing. Anybody who goes up against the prevailing paradigm is dealt with and dealt with severely. Why? What is the prevailing paradigm? The prevailing paradigm is Charlie Darwin that believes that some chimpanzee or whatever, you know, millions of years ago decided to, like, he got tired of dragging his knuckles and he just decided to stand up. Just let me ask you something. Show me one, anything on this planet that's becoming something else. Just one example of something, a platypus that's growing an extra fin because it wants to get back into the ocean. I mean, just show me anything. They can't. And they know they can't, they know it's bogus. Why? Because the DNA is a code. 
and everything, what the Bible says, reproduces according to its kind. Now, that was written well in advance of Darwin. Darwin had, had no idea what he was getting into, but the whole idea that everything reproduces according to its time was proven by Watson and Crick, who discovered, discovered what was already there for who knows how long, the deoxyribonucleic acid, the double helix spiral of life, the building blocks of everything on this planet, the DNA. If two hummingbirds meet, and they mate, and they fall in love, and they have babies, they're not getting kangaroos in that nest. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. We've got kangaroos at our house, though. <laughs> so let's move on. This is a bas relief. Well, if giants really weren't nine feet tall. Oh, really, then why, why are they doing this? Well, they just wanted to show how puny we were. No, nonsense. They were there. This is a, 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 a petroglyph in the four corners of the Navajo Indian Reservation, which my friend, who's a pastor, he said, oh, hey, after I listen to you, I think I know where one is. And we go out there, and sure enough, there it is, little guy, big guy. It's in their oral tradition. This is a 28 and a half pound ax head. Definitely is one the DVD book. Set? No. And I'm just gonna skip it and to no where it is. So, and the archeologist, anything that doesn't fit is either lost and never seen again, or it's ceremonial. That's their favorite expression. Everything is ceremonial. LA, obviously this ax head was ceremonial and presented to a chief to show how great he was. Chief, here's your 28 and a half pound ax head, which you can't use for anything, but it's ceremonial. May the Lord be with you. I mean, it's just, it's just wacky stuff. They make it up. They have no idea where this stuff comes from. The Nephilim lands. Uh, Bob Shelley found this. Chief Joseph Irwin, we all thought it was a sword. Chief Joseph Irwin was going, no, no, it's a lance. This thing's almost three feet long. It's made of bronze. Native Americans didn't work in bronze. Check out where we did the uh, analysis. England, Spain, and Greece. What's it doing in Michigan in the middle of nowhere? Because according to Chief Joseph, the oral tradition, these giants that were 9, 10, 12 feet tall would come in with these huge lances, and they would spear the braves like this, lift them up, and then go through two others and lift up three braves at a time. Or they would come in and rip their heads off, pick them up like a Coke bottle and drink the blood, throw the body on the ground. Sorry for being so disgusting. That's Chief Joseph's oral tradition, which of course, well, that's just a nice bedtime story to tell your kids. <laughs> really? Okay, we got through one with 25 minutes left. I'm gonna have to talk faster. This is called Mathematical Middle of the Mound Builders. <laughs> I can't go any slower than that, Olay. And what's amazing about this, we talked about this, it was my daughter's here, I'm not gonna embarrass her, but she's just totally cracking up. Anyway, I'm not gonna tell you where she is. Hi, Corey. So, <laughs> so everything's on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Uh, America's Stonehenge, we filmed there for five days. We haven't done anything with the film yet. That's, um, three are out, four is in, is in the hopper, the DNA. Five is on UFOs, because we have to. Six and seven will be on America Stonehenge. But America Stonehenge is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. The Octagon Mountain in Newark, Ohio is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Uh, Stonehenge in England is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Uh, Karnak, France is built on an 18 and a half year, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. How did you know, and remember I talked about this earlier? How do you know, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but some of you guys were in at lunch. How many people were not at lunch today? Raise your hand. Raise, raise them up, raise them up. Yeah, so about, about a third of the audience. Real quickly, an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. So we know the moon does this waxing and waning deal for 18 and a half years. We know that, okay? How do we know that? Well, because we're told that. Well, who told them? Where does it come from? And we know that the Babylonians had it and whoever built these sites had it. But the Native Americans didn't know about an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Europeans didn't know. But the megalithic builders knew. How do they know? Real quickly, if it's 18 years and this whole audience, we all go out, and we, we get a, 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 there's two hills in the distance that make a little valley, right? And there's a tree in front of that. We plant a stake. So we're back there. Here's our observation deck. Moon comes up, put a little notch on the stake, and we watch it go like this, and it, and it sets over here. So we gotta watch that, and we gotta take the data, and we have to plot the data. And we do this for 30 days consecutively. And we're doing pretty good. You know, we've got our sticks and they're all notched and we're trying to figure out, well, this is pretty cool, you know, we're, we're gonna solve this riddle anyway. And uh, the next five days it rains, there's a cloud cover, we can't see the moon, now what? And when we're doing this, how would we know if we're in year two, year 17, year four, year one, we wouldn't know. And then how do you crunch the data so you finally know, ha ha, 
I think we're at the end of a cycle because this looks exactly like this one way over here. Okay, great. 18 and a half years. How would you know that? That's the smoking gun on all these sites. No one is addressing it. I mean, no one is addressing it. And yet you talk to these archaeologists, yes, the site was built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. <clears throat> they were master astronomers. Really? The Book of Enoch tells us that Sariel, a fallen angel, handed the information to mankind before the flood. And that's what I'm going with. 18 and a half year lunar cycle. You also get advanced mathematics. You get isosceles triangles. You get advanced surveying techniques. I mean, it's absolutely everywhere. Archaeological Atlas of Ohio, 10,000 mounds. That's not all of them, but that's a lot of them. 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. The Great Circle Mound, check this out. Look how tiny the houses are. <coughs> if you can, if you can, look at the trees and erase them and realize from here, that that great circle mound is what I'm showing you now. See down in the lower right-hand corner? That's the great circle mound. Above it is the octagon mound. See that? And then there's Geller Hill, forming a perfect isosceles triangle. Geller Hill is what we believe was a Nephilim burial ground. So let's go back, and we'll look at this, and I'm going to fast forward it just a little bit. <coughs> That's the great circle mound. It has a moat in the interior of it. See the cars in the parking lot? And that plaza, which is about 30 acres, is pretty much dead level. So without transits or anything else, how do you do that? And, and how does a hunter-gatherer group of people create this? So this is Bruce Willis. Todd Willis is um, walking Todd the Willis, of, Bruce the Willis. of the great Could you turn circle. the volume down? Thank you. <clears throat> so this is the bottom of the moat here. And this is where Todd's walking, and I just want to show you that. That's, that's the bottom of the moat, which is essentially dead level. <clears throat> After thousands of years of silt falling into it, he estimated that there was six inches to a foot of variance between it. So for our practical purposes, for our study, we believe it was at one time, before the silt came in, it was dead level. Because if it's thousands of years old, you know stuff's going to fall in there over a period of time, leaves and debris, especially if the site is abandoned. So Will Willis um, was our surveyor, and he's blown away, absolutely blown away. But the, the circle mound, remember this here? The circle mound here, there's one exactly like it in England, where we just were, in Avesbury, and that moat is out of chalk. And guess what? You can't dig chalk. You ever try to dig chalk? So this is thousands of years old, and this chalk, this moat goes down 30 feet, and they're not sure it may even go b below that. And chalk is like really, really hard. So we were there, and we're just blown away by what we're seeing. But of course, archaeologists will say, there's absolutely no comparison between that circle mound, which looks exactly like this, by the way, and the, and the mound in Newark. Absolutely no connection, just coink a dink. Some people just, you know, they just mine linked or something. I mean. But there's a connection, because we think there was a migration of, of these people. There's Todd. So there's, that's a shot of the octagon mount from the air. <clears throat> and in order to see that, we flew the drone 800 feet, and we barely caught it. And that gives you an idea of what you're looking at. <clears throat> it's an unequal octagon. The octagon takes up just the octagon, not the circle in front of it. The octagon takes up 50 acres. So how do you do that? and make this and make it so precise if you can't see what you're making, because you can't. Yeah. Move it a little over to the left, Harry. No, 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 left, left, what? <laughs> you know, there's no walkie-talkies. <laughs> they're looking pretty good there, 10-4. Uh, there's no walkie-talkies 3,000 years ago. So how the heck are they doing this? Oh, well, they were master surveyors. Mm. Oh, really, well, where are the surveying tools? Well, they didn't have them, they had their inner eye. That was, I mean, it's just nonsense. They have no idea how this stuff was done. This is, volume please. This is Dorothy Isley. And she's talking about. Do construction. Do construct something like this requires a knowledge of geometry. It requires a this knowledge is from the film. of angles, of bisecting angles, of adding angles, subtracting angles. Um, 
I, I think there was a good knowledge of geometry that went behind the design of this. Okay, stop. A good knowledge of geometry. Native Americans, and this is not, you know, if you say this, oh, Marzulli's a racist. He's saying that Native Americans didn't have this. I'm not saying they didn't have it. Europeans didn't have it. That doesn't make me a racist. You know, just because the Italians invented the uh, telephone. Tesla did LA, we all know that. But you know, Mark Marconi with, with the radio thing, right? I mean, does that mean the rest of the world is stupid? No, it just means that Marconi figured it out. It was Tesla LA. It was Tesla, okay. You get what I'm saying? They didn't know. They did not know. They didn't work in geometry. So some, this is what I mean. But they, but they have a paradigm and they have to shoehorn all the evidence into that paradigm no matter what. Oh, they were master builders. Oh, they had surveying equipment. Oh, they knew geometry in the 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Oh, they, they did the one basket full of time. It's just, it, the whole thing, when you start to deconstruct it, it just collapses of its own weight. It's absolute nonsense. But because I'm a frank supernaturalist that believes in the biblical prophetic narrative, I'm looked at, you know, like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat, and I guess most times I am. But just like the 30 years ago when I was banging on the UFO thing, and people in my church that I was going to looked at me like I had four heads at that point, and I was talking about the same stuff I'm talking about here, now it's on Fox News. So now what do we do? Nork's advanced mathematics squaring the circle. And I just want to say that, let me go back here for Dorothy. Okay, I'm looking I'm going to go to the very end. Listen to what she says here. Be, that would be sufficient evidence to say the student was cheating. Um, there's, I see no way it happened intuitively or by chance. So it's not by chance, it's not intuitive. So there's advanced geometry, there's advanced mathematics. I mean, I look at this and I, my head spins. You know, I don't, I don't know how you do this. Because, you know, I mean, I could sit and learn it, but I don't know. I don't know. That's geometry. And again, you know, sitting down and drawing circles and octagons, <clears throat> you've got to, everything is, has to be precise. You need to know the angle and all this stuff. And it's one thing to draw it on a piece of paper. It's another thing over 50 acres. You know, I mean, how would you do that? And yet it's there, and it's screaming at us that's something else. Fingerprints of a supernatural? You bet. Let's move on. No. Uh, just like in the first show, uh, we mentioned this <coughs> Watch his eyes. Who, on record, said, we, we didn't build these things. But yet, if you go up to uh, these areas that, that are under the Shawnee uh, jurisdiction of protection, so where these, these mounds and things are, and it says that the Shawnee built them. You know, so all, there's a false narrative that's already being put in place, uh, even when the people themselves say, it wasn't us. Talking about so the serpent we're, mound. We're not, we're not talking about... That's Chief Joseph Riverman talking about the serpent mound, the scientists that said that Shawnee built them. And Chief Joseph is saying, Shawnee didn't, Shawnee didn't do it. The chief is saying it. Watch, watch his face. Watch his countenance. Oh, just uh, two or three hundred years ago, white settlers asking the, you know, the natives, say, hey, who built this? And I'm saying, we don't know. Uh, we didn't do it. We're talking 10, 15 years ago. You know, <laughs> modern day... Uh, uh, white settlers asking, hey, who built these? And the chief of a nation says, it wasn't us. But yet history still says, we're going to say it was you. So there's a great injustice being done there because that's purposely being deceitful. Uh, and it's also dishonoring and disrespecting the First Nations people and saying that our oral tradition doesn't matter if it doesn't fit the narrative of their historical paradigm. I mean, you can't say it any, any, you know, any clearer than that. And you can see his whole countenance changes. This is um, drone footage of all the mounds. <clears throat> this is at the end <coughs> of, of, one of the, one of the films. Turn up the volume, please. This is called the Seep Mound, and that's Fritz Zimmerman standing on it. <clears throat> this is a mound on private property, which we were interested in digging, but it had already been done twice, so we're not going to go. formations that you can only see from the air.
This is Fort Ancient. This is called the Graves Creek Mound. Nine foot skeletons were found here. Look at the houses. One basket full at a time, LA. A stone mound on private property in Ohio, which someone got a dead end with a backhoe and destroyed it, dug it all up. We don't know if, what he found. This is a, one of the circles in the Octagon Mound Complex. This is called the Junction Group. Look at the houses and the cars and the road. Look at the size of the mounds of the dead of the circles. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna stop. There's only two more things and I'm gonna move on because I only have 12 minutes. Episode three, Secrets of a Supernatural Voices from the Other Side. And we're gonna go. So, Fritz took us to Geller Hill. Geller Hill, we believe, was a Nephilim burial, ancient Nephilim burial site. So you can see the relationship between the Great Circle, the Octagon Mountain, and Geller Hill. <clears throat> I realize I'm going really fast. There's a paranormal group that's with us. They call the Fritz and they go, hey, we understand you're in you know, uh, Newark, Ohio. We'd like to tag along with you. Can we? Fritz goes, calls me up. I go, yeah, whatever. Just make sure we're not in the shot. I don't know anything about paranormal groups. Sounded like a fun thing, maybe. So these guys come. Here they are. Joe and Ray Lynn, <clears throat> and they come and um, we're, we're on Geller Hill where allegedly burials like this were there. So <clears throat> it's raining and we can't use the cameras. It's like a light mist, we can't fly with a drone. So there's a forest like 50 feet away. And it's, and it's a very nice manicured managed forest. And so we go in this thing and this, this woman, Ray Lynn, turns on this little machine called an obelisk. I have no idea what this thing is, and it goes, it says the word evil, and you hear it and as, as, it, as it, you know, you see the word. And the obelisk is a machine that's got 5,000 words embedded in it, so entities that are around can interface with this and speak to you. <laughs> but I still don't know what I'm looking at till the next word pops up 50 yards down the road, which is witch. And at this point I go, okay, okay, wait a minute. We can't do this, I know what this is. This is high-tech divination. This is a modern-day Ouija board. So I pray, and this is all on camera, it's not set up. I had no idea what it, what it was we were about to get into, okay? But I know enough that I'm not gonna sit here and watch this stuff continue. So I don't, so I, I just shut it down. In the name of Jesus, we forbid you to manifest. Your assignment is over. You can no longer access this machine by the blood of a lamb. So she turns it off, right? She turns it off. And then I say, we'll turn it back on again. So she turns it back on and she waits about 30 seconds and the word holy comes up and that's on film. She had never seen anything like it. And look at her face, she's like, what? Everyone was totally freaked out because we shut it down. I didn't shut it down, he shut it down. Amen. Amen. So what happened was they go, okay, Marjorie, you gotta get out of here, you're ruining all of our machines. We, we can't access the ghost and stuff, get out, get out. So I go down to where the cars are in the parking lot they got nothing the rest of the day. That's all on film. This is Pastor Tom Olson. He was a pastor of a Lutheran church in Newark, Ohio, okay? So he's there and he's telling me these stories when he was hired as a pastor and he had no idea of anything about deliverance, no idea about the mounds or the supernatural implications of the mound. He starts getting calls from parishioners and they would go and open up the door to the crawl space in the cellar and it would be a normal crawl space. But sometimes they would open the door and it would be a bottomless pit. And they would throw things down in the bottomless pit and they would never hear it end. And they would, and that's why they called him. It's like, oh, how is that going on here? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? And he's all freaked out because he's had no experience with this. So he goes and he prays over the thing and he shuts it down. One time he walked into a house that was having all sorts of crazy activity and the table was levitating. You see, these are charged sites. They are ritualistically charged sites. And I know some people believe in it, some people don't, but they are charged sites. And we've got all this information and experienced it ourselves on these locations, which is why wherever we go, we pray up. But I gotta tell you, I don't think we prayed up enough because when we got back from 28 days on the road, um, we had a fatality in our group. 
the, the girl, the camera girl's grandmother, she was driving four or five days after she got back and she was out of the blue, T-boned by a truck and the grandmother passed away at 97. And then our, our, our guide, Francisco, son came down with acute appendicitis, had to get rushed to the hospital. Yours truly battled with acute depression for about two to three weeks. So did we pray up enough? Probably not. This stuff is sobering. So here's Gilgal Raphaim. Oops. Here's Gilgal Raphaim. I thought this was a, a video. If it's not, I'll just, okay. Gilgal Raphaim is in the Golan. It's, I talked about this. You can see how small the people are. The drone's up about 200, 200, 200 to 250 feet. Um, this circle might be 7,000 years old. No one really knows how old it is. And it's in the place where Og or Og, king of Bashan, <laughs> used to live. Gilgal Raphaim, the wheel of the giants, the circle of the giants. Here's another shot of the great serpent mound. You can see very plainly the, the uh, serpent with its mouth agape, opening the egg. So let me ask you something. Why is it that when Henry Groover, who goes out to different places, and this, he's been called to do this, he does prayer walks on the land, and he, and he takes back the sacrifices, the ritual sacrifices, the bloodshed that's been done on these sites and consecrates it to the Lord. That's what he does. So he goes to the serpent mound, and it's snowing. He puts on a light jacket. He hops out of his van. He goes to the head of this thing, and he begins to pray. On his way back, he's hit with something visceral. Boom, he's hit in his solar plexus. Down he goes in four inches of snow, and guess what? The snow is coming down. And, he, and his knees are up in his chest, and he can't move. He's like he's paralyzed. And it's like after like 10 minutes of this, he realizes that they're going to find me frozen here. They're going to find me dead here. And so he begins to pray to the Lord. Lord, you know, this is, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? The Lord finally speaks to him and goes, Henry, I didn't tell you to come in here. This is a lesson. I didn't tell you to come in here. You know, you don't, you've been on the road for 75 days. You're, you're spiritually exhausted. You shouldn't be here. It's a lesson not only to him, but to me and to all of us who are engaged in this stuff, that the battle is very real. So the Lord healed him, released him. Henry gets back in the van and off he goes. The bottom line is, this stuff is all too real. All too real. So why is it that Honbat's men, <clears throat> the Mayan elder, and the 13 crystal skulls show up at the serpent mound? You know, what are they doing there? Why are they here in the Americas going to all these ancient sites from coast to coast? What are they doing here? What do they know that we don't? What do they know that the church is completely and utterly ignorant of? And as Gary Stearman said this afternoon or this morning, it's us. We should be the ones. We're the experts. But we're not taught this stuff, but you're being taught this stuff tonight on some level. So we're arming you. We're preparing all of us in this room to understand what's going on here. Hunbat's men comes in with 13 crystal skulls and all the Mayan elders. They do all this procession. The people who were there at the Serpent Mound, and it's in the film, Secrets of a Supernatural, when you get to this part, you'll hear this. <coughs> but there's like 300 people doing it. <clears throat> what are they doing? They're opening up the gateway. They're opening up the area. They're recharging it. That's what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. Why? Because they have the power. Why? Because as shamans, in order to become a shaman, you've got to kill a family member. Who do you serve? You serve the Dark Lord. That's who you serve. That's the way it works, and that's when you get the power. Ritualistic sacrifice all through America. It's kept down. Law enforcement doesn't report it, but it's there. Ritualistic satanic sacrifice is always done because the life is in the blood. That's what's going on here. This stuff is dark. It's not meant to scare us but it's meant to equip us. We've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It's us that we should, when we know what we're looking at, we know, ha ha, that's the fingerprints of a supernatural. We are surrounded by it, but we're not taught it. And that we wonder why in Ohio, there's such depression and poverty and just, and drugs and everything else. There's a principality. There's a stronghold over that area, as there are in many places. The church needs to get together and come to, and, and do this on Sunday. Instead of spending eight seconds on prayer, which is about the average church spends, <clears throat> we need to be co coalescing and targeting the abortion clinics, targeting the crack house, targeting the child trafficking, child, you know, the, the, whole, the whole deal. That's what we need to be doing. But we don't. We don't. And what does Jesus say? And take us up with him, not me. I don't want to hear it. In the latter days, they will have a form of religion, but deny its power. And that's what's going on here. Where's the power? When was the last time you saw anybody healed in your church? Just tell me when. Just tell me when.
It happens. I've seen it. He's here. He loves us. It's not hopeless. But unless we come together, and this is a whole other presentation, you know, 1.8 or 1.5 billion abortions on the planet since Roe v. Wade, 1.5, that's a whole other presentation. <clears throat> 1.5 billion abortions. If you think, if you can sit there and think for one second that that has not changed the spiritual atmosphere on this planet, then come see me after class, seriously. It's changed everything, absolutely everything. And that's why we're in unprecedented times. The life is in the blood. These are ritualistically done human sacrifices to who? The dark one. And that's why we need to stand up and we need to push back. That's why we need to start telling people. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So why is this important? What's, what's your takeaway? Take back control of a narrative on all these sites. Study to show yourself approved. You might not get into the depth that I am. I'm called to do this stuff. Go figure. But it validates the Native American oral tradition, which is why I think I'm being contacted by First Nation people, because they realize that I'm not the typical guy. I'm just not going to listen to their story and go, well, that's just a bunch of hooey and walk out of the room and never see, the, see them again. I take very seriously what they tell me. More importantly than the Native American oral tradition, it validates the biblical prophetic narrative. It shows us that the giants were here, that they were real. And who are the giants? Unless we come to an understanding of Genesis 3.15 and understand what that is, that the seed of the dragon will be at war at enmity with the seed of the woman. The seed, the offspring of the dragon, will be at enmity, at war with the seed of the woman. He, Messiah that's going to come, will crush the serpent's head, but the serpent will bruise his heel. Unless we understand Genesis 3.15, when we get to the Tower of Babel, when we get to Abraham and the five kings, when we finally get to Sodom and Gomorrah, when we see the conquest of Canaan, we have no idea what's going on. None. None. And there are great seminaries around here which teach that the Nephilim really weren't there. There were no such thing as giants go home. Then why is God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? Then why in Jude do we hear about the angels who sin are in their, you know, dark dungeons? Similarly, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's all there. Once we come to an understanding of Genesis 3.15, everything becomes clear. That seed, the offspring, is at war. It's a seed war and it's going on right now. The seed war, this is the new book I'm writing. I got 21 seconds, so I can go about, probably about 50 seconds. This is the last slide. It establishes the reality of a supernatural worldview. It establishes the reality of a supernatural worldview. It establishes the reality of a supernatural worldview. The supernatural to me is more real than the natural world around us. And if we could see it, we'd all be just blown away. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.